Hey, just real quickly, too, on that video that you just saw with all the smart stuff on, I did the math on that in case you're wondering how much all that costs. And it's $5.92. It's $6 for everything I was wearing. So it's not that expensive. You know, Joe wears a much more expensive outfit. But what you saw in that video is all that's required. So the mask alone is about $25, but you can wear it for about three months safely. That's the cool thing. Um, unless you do a ton like I was doing for a while, then you got to replace it maybe every two months. So you just got to kind of play that out. But about six bucks. So if you want to do some extra charge for safe removal, that's up to you. I never did. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to read my own bio, um, but I am a past president of this academy. Uh, I'm the meetings chairman, and I'm in. I'm on the fluoride committee and the mentor committee. I'm also the annoying voice you'll hear on all the e-learning videos. And I'm not being humble because I know my voice, and uh, I apologize in advance for that. Fluoride. So I love that you, it was you who asked the question about science, so I'm going to inundate you with a lot uh, in the next two hours. Maybe not at first, but trust me, I, I, I love to get into that because that's, that's what this academy is about, and that's what excited me about doing fluoride is that there's a ton of science out there uh, that's contrary to what we were all taught in dental school. And full disclosure, I graduated in 1993. I believed in fluoride. I promoted it for a year. I, the first little article that I ever wrote in a little local rag, I think it was called Sealed for Health or something like that, and I talked about using a fluoridated toothpaste. So I'm not a guy that came out of school not believing what I was taught. Let me just read a real important uh, quote here that I hope will show up. There it is. Disease is not due to the presence of bacteria, but rather to the body being out of balance in such a way that the bacteria responsible for the inflammation are breeding out of control. Killing the bacteria is not the answer. Placing the body back in balance is a much more effective method of treatment. Did anybody ever hear about Melvin Page in dental school? You did? Not in dental school, right? So two, so two dentists that are heroes of mine are Melvin Page and Weston Price, and we never learned about either of them in dental school, but they were amazing dentists that offered so much to our profession that it would take hours just to cover what they taught. But what's he talking about here? He's talking about the microbiome, right? We're taught to kill in school, and that's not what it's about. It's, it's all about balance. So I just wanted to throw that in there for you guys. Um, so we probably should have called it the smarter version because, you know, saying smart, it's like we're saying that it's the only way to do it, and it's really not. So we want to make that clear. It's the safest way that we know to protect yourself and your patients and your staff and all that. But again, don't make it, it it's going to seem like when I first saw that video, I thought this is going to be too overwhelming for somebody that's first getting into this and say, I'm just not going to do it. And I get that because it, it does seem daunting, but it really isn't. Once you get the equipment, I mean, those gowns are cheap. The little plastic shields are cheap. The mask is the most expensive thing. The air vac thing, you know, that, that's a one-time cost. Yes, you got to change filters throughout the year, but, you know, in the whole scheme of things, we should probably have that in our offices anyway. Um, it, it just looks better. Um, so it don't let anything that you saw there be too overwhelming because, and it seems like all y'all are, are members already, which is awesome, because usually this is a new group that people just hear for the first time. Anybody here for the first time ever? Okay, well, a special welcome to you guys. Thank you. I mean, it's a, it's a overwhelming thing sometimes to to, to, to come to a meeting like this, and I love that you asked the question about science because I want you to be skeptical throughout this entire day and question us, you know, because um, that's what it's about, right? When I get into an argument with someone, I want to know, you know, I've been to a lot of fluoridation fights, and most of the time it's embarrassing because I come with all the evidence, and they basically say the same things. You know, the CDC says it's one of the 10 greatest accomplishments. That's not an answer, you know? Quit citing the same stuff. Let's really get into the science of this, and then let's see if people can make their decision at that point. But experts against experts never wins. It's usually a waste of time, but that's a whole aside here, which I'll talk about. Fluoride in our community water is a good thing. Nice. Here's why. Community water fluoridation is considered one of 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century. In fact, over 100 national health organizations recognize the public health benefits of fluoride in our community water. It's so important that we prevent tooth decay, which can be a very serious disease if it's not treated. Water fluoridation helps adults as well as children. We have evidence on that. People are keeping their teeth longer, thank goodness. It's effective. 
I'm a mom, I'm a dental hygienist, and I'm also a researcher. And I like to wear all three hats. I always try to find the best science and evidence when I'm trying to make um, decisions about my children. And fluoride, especially through community water fluoridation, is one of those no-brainers. It's safe. Fluoride in community water is absolutely safe. It's been used for over 70 years to help prevent tooth decay. Thousands of Americans are being misinformed about the safety and benefits of fluoridation. Now, if they go to a credible source, if they go to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, if they go to the American Dental Association, if they go to ILikeMyTeeth.org, when they go to credible sources, they get the facts, the true science, and information. I have absolutely no concern about community water fluoridation harming the children. I'm actually more concerned about not having fluoride. Fluoride is natural. It's a fact that fluoride is naturally present in soil, rivers, lakes, and even the ocean. Water fluoridation is the addition of fluoride up to the recommended level for preventing tooth decay. It's similar to fortifying other foods and beverages, like fortifying salt with iodine, milk with vitamin D, orange juice with calcium, and bread with folic acid. It's preventive. Why do you need to treat the disease when you can prevent it? It makes sense to prevent disease. Okay. So I know you guys probably already caught it, but iodine, vitamin D, calcium, and folic acid are all essential nutrients. Fluoride is not. You can't compare that. And I hate when they do that. It's not the same thing. Um, and saying something's been around for 70 years isn't a scientific statement. It doesn't make it fact just because it's been around for a long time. So those are the two things I want to point out. Also, remember his face because I'm going to get back to him later on. Um, I will. All right, so let's get into the, just the... Basics, we all learned this in dental school, right? Fluorine, the, the two most important things that I want you to remember from this slide, I have bold face there and highlighted. So it's the most reactive element on the entire periodic table, which is why fluorine is hardly ever found in the environment as fluorine, right? Because it just binds to other things so quickly. So we'll talk about fluoride mostly here. Let me change this thing here. Um, and also, it's not essential for growth and development, which I already said. So you can look at everything else. We all learned about it. We know the number on the periodic chart and all that. You guys probably know now that uh, uh, Harvard paper that came out just a couple years ago confirmed fluoride as one of the 12 neurotoxic elements out there now. So once that came out, that was really uh, harmful to organized dentistry, and it should be. Okay, just a brief history. I, we won't, I won't go through every item here, but uh, you guys know about Henry Moisson was the first guy that basically isolated fluorine in 1886. 1930s, this is actually not accurate. So Frederick McKay, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, I think this dentist, he's the guy from Colorado Springs who saw the brown spots on the teeth and thought, why all these kids with the brown spots don't have decay? So something's going on. And really, 1901 is when he started studying this. So this guy did a 30-year study on his own to figure out why, why do the kids in my, my community with the brown spots don't have decay and other ones do. Now, I know what you guys were thinking. Well, there you go. Fluoride stops decay. But remember what we're talking about. We're talking about naturally occurring fluoride, which is usually calcium fluoride. Okay, We're not talking about sodium fluoride or worse, the hydrofluosilicic acid. FSA, fluorosilicic acid, I'll use that probably throughout the day, so I don't have to say the word so long. Artificial fluoride, which is added to the water supply, is what, is what we're using to try to prevent decay. We're not talking about naturally occurring fluoride. And high amounts still, by the way, seeing the modeling on your teeth and all those brown spots, that's not a good thing. That, that's the cosmetic thing that we can see, but understand that there's already been a lot of damage done inside the body. I promise I'm not going to go on fluoridation this first hour. It's going to be all topical, but I just want to give you a little history first, okay? Uh, 1942 through 45, they used it to make the atomic bomb. Uh, if any of you have, have ever heard of Harold Hodge, anybody know Harold Hodge besides David Kennedy, who's in the room? Harold Hodge was the researcher that was in charge of the Manhattan Project, okay, which made the atomic bomb. And what you guys don't know is that a lot of the workers were getting very, very sick and dying, and they couldn't figure out why. Hodge knew. But Hodge became the spokesperson for water fluoridation. He's the guy you see up at the chalkboard going, one part per million is what, you know, all that. So it's interesting that if, if you ever want to read the history of it, um, it reads like a mystery novel. It's unreal how something that was 
naturally in the earth became this panacea for dentistry. Uh, 1944, uh, our own journal, right, Jada, came out very heavily against it. They said this should not be used. We don't know enough about it. It seems very toxic. A quote that's famous for what they said about it. But what's really weird is in less than a year, 1945 is when Grand Rapids, Michigan became the first city to actually fluoridate in this country. And uh, I'm going to touch on this whole 15-year experiment because that's not at all what happened, but that's what we're told. It was a 15-year experiment. Okay, 1950s, fluoride supplements are made and prescribed. Uh, 1960 is when they start doing water fluoridation pretty much everywhere. Uh, 1960s also is when the fluoridated toothpaste was introduced in glass ionomer cement, which is loaded with fluoride. 70s is when sealants came out. 80s are the fluoroquinolones, so the antibiotics, you know, Prozac and all those, all the quinolones and the uh, floxins uh, were introduced, and they have fluoride in them. 2014, this is a little bit dated, but at that point, over 210 million Americans are known to be drinking fluoridated water. Keep in mind, uh, as 95% um, of the world does not fluoridate. 95% does not fluoridate. So it's interesting. We're in a very small, small minority, but we're pretty powerful. Okay, this is the ADA's position on fluoride as recently as 2017, and I think it's exactly the same today. The American Dental Association unreservedly endorses the fluoridation of community water supplies as safe, effective, and necessary in preventing tooth decay. This report has been the association's position since policy was first adopted in 1950. So you're going to see in a second how we feel about it, but, you know, they have their, their right to say how they feel about it. This hasn't changed in a long time, by the way. And I will give them credit where it's due, which we'll touch on later. They have done some changes here. So um, uh, David Kennedy, who you saw first this morning, myself, Jack Call, and Amanda Just put together uh, our position paper against fluoride use, and you can find it on our website. Uh, we did this back in 2017, I think. So there's a lot of science in that, a ton. And, and we, everything we say, we always cite with science. And by the way, everything that I'll show you today, um, where I'm showing you things that maybe are counter to what we were taught in school, all peer-reviewed journals, okay? That, that's important to note, and we'll get into that as well. You guys may know this already, so I won't beat a dead horse here, but did you know that uh, these are all the places where fluoride is, and there's even more? So dental varnishes we'll touch on a bit later. Fluoride supplements, we'll get into that later as well. But, I mean, besides toothpaste, it's in a lot. I didn't know for the longest time that they had floss with fluoride on it. I'm, I'm not sure uh, when that came out, but uh, they've got that as well. Beverages, any beverage that's made, uh, what, you know, either Coca-Cola or juices or wherever, you have to find out where the city that they're actually made because they're probably fluoridated as well. Okay, raisins are uh, very high in fluoride, as is tea, black tea, as you guys know. Okay, so why are we concerned about it? These are just a few of the reasons, right? Lifetime of exposure, uh, it harms all, all people. Uh, infants who are bottle-fed, they get 250 times plus more than they should based on their body weight, right? So if a baby is bottle fed, that baby, the, pre the, the predominant thing in their diet, his or her diet is water, right? And most of the time it's gonna be tap. Hopefully not, but most of the time it is. Uh, swallowing toothpaste, obviously you can overdose on that. That's written on the actual toothpaste itself. And uh, a lot of adverse health effects, a lot. So this is our, our position. Given the elevated number of fluoride sources and the increased rates of fluoride intake in the American population, which have risen substantially since water fluoridation began in the 1940s, it has become a necessity to reduce and work toward eliminating avoidable sources of fluoride exposure, including water fluoridation, fluoride-containing dental materials, and other fluoridated products. All right, let's get into topical, okay? Because I want to spend hopefully most of this hour on that. Um, you guys all know this graph. We all were taught this in school, and it's true. When fluoride interacts with enamel, it replaces the hydroxyl group of hydroxyapatite and becomes fluoroapatite. Okay? That's all true. Um, you know, the uh, increased hydrogen bonding and the smaller little crystal lattices in the enamel is what does contribute to a decrease in solubility. So you're going to hear some stuff that's true 
about how fluoride works because it does change the enamel. That's true. So this is, um, so I, it was, it's challenging now to do this, but um, you can go to the ADA website and get quite a bit of stuff on fluoridation and fluoride, but a lot of it you have to pay for now. Do you guys know that as members? Uh, if you want to get the fluoridation facts, you have to pay for that? Do you know that? I feel like we're, we're the reason why, and I'm proud of that, but uh, uh, a few years ago, I, maybe four or five years ago, I spoke on this in Reno, and I, and I sort of blasted the whole fluoridation facts, and shortly thereafter, it was, uh, it was taken down, they revamped it, added some new stuff, mostly against people like us. Um, and now you have to pay to get access to it. So I find that interesting. But let's just look really quickly here. And I, again, I, I, is it orange showing up? Yeah, it is. So this is what they're saying about topical fluoride, uh, that the fluoride in toothpaste is taken up directly by the dental plaque and demineralized enamel and also increases the concentration of fluoride in saliva. True to some degree. Brushing with fluoride toothpaste increases the fluoride concentration in saliva 100 to 1,000 fold. This concentration returns to baseline levels within one to two hours. And you see there are sources at the bottom there. I'm going to always show you that. It's basically the CDC, um, and they have a report. Uh, uh, it's called uh, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. They do this through the CDC. And by the way, if you guys don't know, I think the CDC is about 25,000 members. The oral health division, though, is about 30. So it's pretty small, and a lot of them aren't dentists, just so you know. So let's assume that's all true. Let's do just a couple questions today. This is a true-false quiz. When fluoride is added to drinking water, it comes out in saliva and hardens the enamel and reduces tooth decay. So I just told you that it does that, but believe it or not, the correct answer is false. So only minimal amounts are found in saliva, and John Featherstone... Uh, some of you are probably too young. Some of you already know this. John Featherstone was a, is a very reputable researcher. And in, and in 2000, in Jada, he did a report where he was talking about basically water fluoridation. But it was, how does fluoride work? And he unequivocally said that it's not by drinking it. It's topically. Okay, and I'm going to get into that in a second. So, you know, it, you can say that it reduces tooth decay. It does change the solubility. And it does a few other things. But the true answer of that is false. So, nothing to worry about. So, on drugs.com, I just went on, online and, and just started to see what mainstream things were saying. I was curious. So, drugs.com says that sodium fluoride in drinking water or taken as a supplement does not usually cause any side effects. However, taking an overdose of fluoride may cause serious problems. And these include, and you guys can read those, but it's quite a bit, right? I thought that was interesting that that was on that, on that site because it's sort of a mainstream site, but they're at least acknowledging that there's quite a few things that can happen. And this, by the way, I'm going to show you in a second here through some science again that t I'm, I'm talking about topical, okay? Obviously, systemically, I'm going to show you a lot of things later, but let's just stick with topical for now, okay, as much as we can. Here's some more science from Medical News Today. However, it is a myth that fluoride treatments or fluoridated water cause widespread harm. That's what they say. So here's our next question. Fluoride in enamel makes it more resistant to tooth decay. Again, you could say yes, but the actual answer is false. Okay? Now this again is from John Featherstone and the CDC. The prevalence of dental caries in a population is not inversely related to the concentration of fluoride in enamel. Okay, whether it's topically or systemically. And a higher concentration of enamel fluoride, topical, is not necessarily more efficacious in preventing dental caries. So the truth is, is that I'm going to show you what the CDC says it does, and, and I wouldn't argue with it. I would agree with the things that they say that it does to the tooth topically. But the bottom line is, it doesn't really do that. So, and I'm going to show you alternatives, so don't worry. Uh, if you're a fluoride fan, you'll leave here realizing there's plenty of alternatives. But my point is this, is that for the longest time, I argued against water fluoridation, but I was kind of like, yeah, I agree with you topically. You know, if you want to brush with it, it does, do, it does work. And I'm telling you that if you actually get into the deep science of it, it doesn't. It does change hydroxyapatite to fluoroapatite, which does make it a little bit less soluble, okay, a little bit more resistant to the bacteria that are going to destroy it. But what you aren't told 
is what happens to the actual morphology of the enamel. You know it makes it weaker, right? We're told it makes it stronger. But have you ever met a person with any kind of fluorosis, especially severe fluorosis? You can just chip away the enamel with your explorer. You know that, right? And I got in arguments with people where they'd say, it's, that's not true, it makes it stronger. It does not make it stronger. It, it actually changes the collagen matrix of the enamel. So if you want to say it fights decay, that's fine. But the truth is, it's not really doing it. All right, so here's what the CDC says. Let me get on the right thing. It enhances remineralization of a carious lesion. So if you've got a little cavity starting, you had a little topical fluoride, whether it's a varnish or toothpaste or the, or the old gel cam that we use when we all had braces, it's going to do that. It inhibits breakdown, demineralization, true to some degree, and it poisons the enzymes in the oral bacteria that produce acid. So it has an antibacterial effect. So all that sounds good, right? But do you guys notice anything when you, when, when you read those things, right? You can do all three of those things without ever swallowing a drop of it in your entire life, right? All this is topically. Again, I don't think you need it. I just showed you a couple of things I said. You, it, it's really not doing it in a beneficial way. But you can't argue that it does these things. Okay? You don't need to drink it, though. And we'll get, uh, my passion is water fluoridation, but I want to cover as much of topical as I can. Okay, this is a... From the Journal of the American Dental Association, again, JADA, and they, to their credit, and I'm excited about this, because just in 2006, this is quite a departure. This is 2013. In 2006, they were strongly recommending fluoride, okay, in, in both forms. So to their credit, look at the very bottom there. They said, the panel included 71 trials from 82 articles in its review, and assess the efficacy of various topical fluoride carries preventive agents. The panel makes recommendations for further research. That's awesome. Because again, I'm telling you, just a few years earlier, they were saying, we strongly recommend this. So credit where it's due. Making some progress. Okay, this is why we don't recommend it. And this, I believe, yeah, this... Um, so I wrote a, a scientific review for topical fluoride a few years back, and I wanted this in there because I wanted to show damage from topical fluoride, not drinking it. So just take a look here. Sodium fluoride has been shown to basically have cell death in human gingival fibroblasts. This is a 2008 study. Stannous fluoride, which is in most of your sensodynes and things like that, uh, can cause tissue necrosis and permanent alveolar bone loss when used as a subgingival irrigant in periodontal treatment. Did you all know that? 1999. So these are periodontists that were coming out saying we're seeing some, some harm. Topical fluoride use in children is related to a significant increase of fluoride concentration in their urine. We'll talk a lot about that later. And then fluoride gels can result in gastric mucosal injuries. So this is quite a few things, right, that we're talking about here. This is all topical, by the way, okay? No systemic. And by the way, on this last thing about the gels, um, we're talking about concentrations as low as like 1.2%, okay? That's a typical amount that's prescribed when you apply it topically. Okay, gastric injuries, and guess how they actually showed this through science? Gastroscopies. They literally had to make sure they were getting accurate readings. So it wasn't like they were just saying, oh, the kid's complaining. They, they, they did some real science on this. These were just four things that I showed. And again, as I mentioned, it was uh, part of the scientific review a few years back. So, Okay, let's talk about some alternatives now that we've shown you that topical is not all that. Um, anybody use iodine in their practice? Awesome. Yeah, so povidone is the one that we talk about a lot, but I'll talk about a couple others later on. They've, they've actually upped their game a bit. Um, MI paste, right? Minimal intervention paste, you guys use that? Because I'm a huge fan of that. I, I don't, you know, um, even people who are doing radiation treatment, right? Any kind of cancer therapies, and they're always told to get the trays with the fluoride at night. I say, no, get, get MI paste, okay? And I'll show you in a bit how much all, what that paste does is pretty amazing. Uh, ozone, I'm going to talk a bit about as well because it's one of my favorite things in dentistry. It's a life changer. If you don't have that in your practice yet, you're missing out. It's unbelievable. And by the way, mainstream dentistry talks about ozone. Um, in fact, I, 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 Cavo, I think, has they made a handpiece years ago that has ozone or it uses the air in your office but makes a little bit of ozone as well. So pretty cool stuff. Yeah, so, so Cavo made it, but again, it's using Ambient air, I think that's approved. It's not hooking up like you do with medical grade oxygen and doing that. So I think that part is not yet. But still, there's still.
is huge. I don't know why this keeps going out, sorry. Number four is the most important, right? That's the stuff that Weston Price and hopefully a lot of people here at this, in this academy will talk about. That's everything. It's diet. I mean, you know, if you know about Weston Price, you know, he traveled all over the world and looked at all these different civilizations to find out why some kids had rotten teeth and jaw size malformations, crooked teeth, and why others didn't. And it all came down to sugar, basically, is what it was. Western diet. So, I mean, it's, it, that's the bottom line. And whenever a patient says to me, oh, my son's got so much decay, you know, can I do fluoride now? I'm like, you can do what you want. I'm just telling you it's not necessary. Let's talk about some other things. And so have that discussion. It's great. It's, it's the best way to get to know your patients anyway. This is a neat little small graph, basically. This is from the School of Dentistry in Puerto Rico, in San Juan, and they were comparing, you probably can't see because it it's so small, but they were comparing basically using iodine, which is that left green bar, uh, versus four parts per million of fluoride. So we're talking about a pretty high dose of fluoride, right? Four parts per million is like what you would see in like um, those varnishes and things, not, not toothpaste. But look at this. Let me go to the next slide. I think it shows a little bit better. So look at that. After one year, a bit, cavity free. Ninety-one percent of the participants were cavity free, with just a ten percent iodine solution applied six times a year. Honestly, they probably could have got away with two times a year and had the same results. Versus a fifty-four percent caries free reduction or a caries reduction uh, using that four parts per million six times a year. So we're talking about a huge discrepancy. Okay, iodine's pretty amazing. Okay. Oh, by the way, I mentioned that I was going to mention some other ones. So nascent, N-A-S-C-E-N-T, nascent iodine is the best form because it's the most absorbable and it gets to your thyroid quickly. Uh, there's a product out there which I don't use, but it's called Active Eye, Active Iodine. Um, I've never used it, so I can't tell you how to, but look it up. It's supposed to be really, really good. Uh, again, you can just use povidone. You can even add a little water and dilute it, have them gargle, spit it out, whatever. It's not something you want to brush with every day, as I mentioned, right? You know, maybe maybe a couple times a month would be enough, right? Or at least when they come to your office twice a year, hopefully, or whenever they come, you yourself can actually use it as well, okay? Keep in mind, too, that, remember, iodine is going to be, it will beat any other halogen to the thyroid fast, right? And, and, you know, we need our thyroid gland to make our T3 and T4 hormones. So if somebody's getting a lot of iodine in their system, um, you're going to have quite an effect on the thyroid. We'll definitely touch on that in a bit. Trying to stay topically with you guys. Sorry, I always want to. So look at MI paste. Look at all the things it does. This sounds a lot like what we were told about fluoride, right? It alkalinizes things, so no acid erosion. Prevents plaque buildup. Reduces bacteria. Tooth sensitivity. Helps prevent those active and inactive white spot lesions from highly acidic drinks. Helps improve your, your salivary flow. And it replenishes calcium and phosphate. This is probably the most important thing, right? Its main ingredient is called recaldent. CPPACP, which is just an acronym for casein phosphopeptides and amorphous calcium phosphate. So it, it, basically its main ingredient comes from casein in cow's milk, okay? And you're going to replenish the calcium and phosphate in your teeth. So, I mean, I was blessed in my practice that I don't have a whole lot of children that have a lot of rampant decay, but the couple that do, you give them trays with the MI paste, without fluoride, by the way. I, I have that up on the screen there because they do make it without fluoride. And they make it with, too. Um, and it works great. works wonders. You'll actually see some of that demonization go away after just maybe a week or two of wearing those trays. So it's really exciting that we can at least offer something else that's not fluoride. Okay, the second thing that was on my list as an alternative uh, besides fluoride is ozone. And ozone, I'm going to try not to talk too much about it because, as I said, I love it. Uh, and you'll hear about it this afternoon. But look at this. This is an article in the Journal of the... Formosan Medical Association, the, JF, the JFMA. Ozone's antibacterial properties help prevent small cavities from growing larger in the pits and fissures on the biting surfaces of the back teeth. Additionally, ozone may be helpful in disinfecting areas of decay underneath tooth restorations. And they also said they see its use being very beneficial in, in endodontics, TMJ pain, perio, and other infections. And guess where I got this information? from a Colgate white paper. So that's pretty cool, right? Again, I'm going to give credit where it's due. I mean, Colgate is actually wrote a paper, and they talked about the wonders of ozone. So, awesome. 
This is the Saudi Journal for Dental Research. This was relatively recently in 2017, talking about ozone again. And they say, this is attributed not only to the marked antimicrobial properties of ozone, but also to the fact that ozone oxidizes the pyruvic acid produced by the karyogenic bacteria to acetate and carbon dioxide. So this is another relatively mainstream publication that's talking about the wonders of ozone. And you're going to see a lot, by the way. There's over, I don't know what the number is now. Last I checked, it was over 350 articles on ozone and the benefits for the body, but the mouth alone, quite a few as well. Um, here's some other things that they found and said on that same thing. They said, Ozone therapy has a wide range of applications in almost every field of dentistry. Its unique properties include immunostimulant, analgesic, antihypnotic, detoxicating, antimicrobial, bioenergetic, biosynthetic, blah, blah, blah. It's atraumatic, painless, non-invasive nature, and relative absence, I would say absence of discomfort, increased patient's acceptability and compliance, thus making it an ideal treatment choice, especially for children. So this is a mainstream publication saying this. Okay, let's talk about ozone. Let's talk about how it works. So you guys know probably that uh, it's O3, obviously. Uh, it's negatively charged, which is why it's so reactive, because all of the bad stuff is positively charged, right? Your viruses, your fungi, parasites, protozoans, everything, positively charged. So it can carry its electrical charge. It can donate it. It can, it can, it can do its action, which is antibacterial, anti all those things I just mentioned, anti that. Let me show you how this works as an example to say chlorine, right, which is added to water supplies for a good reason, right, to purify it and protect us basically from some bad things in the water. But let me show you the difference here. So look at this. So let's just say we have a big bowl of 4,500 bacteria, right, and we're going to add 45 equal amount of molecules of chlorine to that bucket to kill what's in there. It's going to take about an hour, just under an hour to kill it all, Okay. So now the same amount on this side in a bowl, 4,500 bacteria. We're going to add just one molecule of ozone, and we're going to kill it all in one second. Quite a difference, right? Very cool. Let me get to my next slide on this other side here. Okay. So let me show you an example, too. You can physically see. So we've all had these cavities that get really, really deep. Uh, and by the way, uh, there was a question earlier about amalgams. I think she asked in the back, you know, how much damage do you do and all that. You know, I, 29 years of practice, I, I, there was never a tooth that I was afraid to take the mercury out on. I don't care how big it was. Now, did it, you know, it might have ended up being a crown, but, we, but you can avoid a ton of abscesses, root canals. If you catch these things, even last minute, okay, you're down so deep, there's decay sitting, you know, you see pink. You're on the pulp already. What are you going to do? Leave it. Ozonate the heck out of it. P put a layer down of whatever you like. Well, I don't care if it's if it's calcium hydroxide or any kind of other liner that you use, and then you can fill it up. And if you want to really be safe on those deep ones, you can maybe do like ozone, IRM filling, let them walk around for four to six months, bring them back, check them out with x-rays or whatever. I'm doing fine, doc, feels great. Remove 90% of the IRM and fill up with whatever you want. And I've done that probably well, well over a couple thousand times and had really great success. But check this out. You're going to squirt ozone on there for you know, 30 seconds, and look at how it almost looks etched, right? It's kind of a cool little appearance there. Now, granted, this tooth uh, needed further work. This is not my case. But my point is, is look at the difference of just squirting ozone down on that, on that deeper area there. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, there's another thing that we do called tray therapy. It says periodontal, but honestly, it can be for decay as well, right? You make these trays. They uh, don't make them, but they're made by a laboratory. They make an upper silicone and a lower silicone. There's two ports. There's an in port from the ozone machine and an out port that goes to your suction very on very low because you innervate for about 15 to 20 minutes and just let it sort of ooze all. And those trays will suck up nice and intimately over the teeth and gums. So, yes, you can do periodontal therapy, but you can also take care of cavities. So, again, a, a patient comes in with a lot of incipient lesions, right, the kind that are just in the enamel, not to the dentin. Those are the ones I don't want to touch yet. We talk about flossing, obviously. We talk about diet, but you could also do this. It's not that expensive. The trays are a one-time cost. You'll spend a couple hundred bucks on the trays, but you'll have them forever. Yeah, so each, each, each patient has their own trays. It's theirs. You don't use them for anybody else. So you can use them. I think I used one on a patient probably 
50 times at least, and it was still in great shape. They're silicone, so they don't degrade from the ozone. So, But this is everything right here, in my opinion. Okay, it's diet. And, and unfortunately, you know, Dennis, I mean, look, the cool thing about this venture that you're now on, which you're never going to go back, by the way. It's not going to happen. You're never going to go back to practice in the way you maybe did before. It's exciting life. And you're going to have more conversations that are so deep and fulfilling with patients, and you're going to impact their lives like you've never believed with simple stuff like a, like a discussion on diet, right? I mean, most dentists don't even talk about it. I mean, they may say, look, cut down on sodas or whatever, you know, but the truth is is that you need to get into things like, well, how can we alkalinize your body? You know, do, do patients even know that their pH can range between 7.35 and 7.45? Real small range, right? And so are they alkaline, which you want to be, 95% of the day, maybe the first test you do with the pH paper first thing in the morning might be a little acid, but the rest of the day it better turn deep blue, right? So they don't even know that. And they say, well, how can I do that? Well, there's foods that are alkalinizing, right? These are just a few. Mostly green leafy vegetables are the best. But by the way, the one thing that I don't have, have on this list, and you can have, I believe, uh, is you know organic grass-raised meat, right? Grass-raised. That's the way it always was for many, many, many years. Uh, before Monsanto, but um, you know, the cows eat grass. That's good. That actually will be alkaline in your body. Now, you eat any other kind of meat, it's very acidic, right? Red meat is very acidic in the body if it's not grass-raised. Not grass-finished, grass-raised, okay? It's all about balancing your pH, your electrolyte balance, everything. So these are some good things, but again, they can... I tell patients, look, if I don't have a printout, I'll say, just go online and type in foods that alkalinize versus foods that are acidic. It's that simple. They'll find it. Okay? Remember earlier when they talked about it's just like folic acid and vitamin? No, it's not. It's not an essential nutrient, okay? You do not need it for any reason. Nobody has ever died or suffered an illness because of a lack of fluoride. Okay? It just doesn't happen. Okay? Do you guys know how fluoride, you know, when you, when you get it in your body, right, um, you absorb it very quickly, uh, uh, about 50% of it is absorbed in the gastrointestinal tract after about 30 minutes. Okay, now here's the sad thing. Of the stuff that you absorb, you, you can excrete slowly 50% of that, right? So you're still left with 50%. So whatever fluoride you get in your body, 50% gets retained in, your, in, in tissues, basically, bone. Your calcified tissues, mostly bone. So when you hear talk of osteosarcomas and other bone cancers, which the ADA says is not true, and I'll show you that that's not true. It is true. Um, it's because of fluoride, you know, and it's years of exposure. This is kind of like the deal, too, when someone says, you know, I, you know, 1993, when I started practicing, I was considered quacky because I had to be a mercury-free dentist, right, mercury-safe, and, and I would get teased by my friends, I mean, guys that I was friends with, and I would hear them laugh when I walked away, and they would say, oh, God, the whole mercury thing caused an illness, well, the problem was, was that how, it's not a cause and effect immediately, right? I mean, you can place fillings in someone's mouth, and it might be 20 years before they're sick. And how do you say, it was the fillings? Well, now we can prove it by some mercury tests, and, and if, they, if they're able to eliminate all their exposures of what might have made them sick, you can at least make the argument. But it is a challenge. Same thing with fluoride. You know, it, it, with the exception of something like Minamata Bay, which they talked, he, he touched on earlier this morning. So I was there in 2013. I got to go... Um, as a representative to our academy, and I got to see them talk about this treaty. But the cool thing was, was they actually got us on a high-speed train from where we were down in the lower part of Japan, and we went to Minamata. And it's a small fishing town, and it, there's a few survivors. And when I say that, I mean a few, because there was a company called Chiso Corporation, which literally, and, and they had film of this, they, they were making all this industrial plastics and thing, and fluoride was a byproduct, and they had a big white tube just dumping in the water, and it was all the effluent and, and junk. And they made their living, their livelihood on fishing there. That's how they lived and ate and, and made money. And people were getting sick, like very sick, like crippling where they couldn't walk. Babies were being born just completely deformed. It was, it was awful. And it took about 30 years to finally said, it's that company not only are you shutting down, but you're going to pay, pay these people some money. But come on, what's it worth when you have a crippled child or something that could have been prevented? But I was there, and they had a few survivors, and they're storytellers now. And they would tell you the stories, and it would make you cry because they would share how, 
you know, they were having this great life, and all of a sudden they started getting sick, and then had this baby that's deformed, and they couldn't figure it out. And it was a couple generations before they figured out that it was industry. So sorry to go on that tangent, but it was a, an important moment for me. So let's look at some of fluoride's effects, okay? Poisons enzymes. Affects blood sugar levels, right? It increases your glucose levels. Calcifies the pineal gland. That is the gland that is affected the most by fluoride. Number two is the thyroid. But the pineal gland decreases thyroid function. I just didn't. I got ahead of myself. Impairs kidney function. Lowers IQ. We got a lot of studies on that now. This is the one thing that I think is going to finally get rid of water fluoridation. Bone fragility, dental fluorosis, and skeletal fluorosis at higher levels. It's an endocrine disruptor, a developmental neurotoxin, which we'll show you with science, and a cancer-causative agent. So if I had been told all these things, or even just a couple of these things in school, I said, why are we using this? I mean, is there a reason to use it if it does all these things? Okay. You guys see this? This wasn't that long ago. What, um, what's the year on this? I can't even read it now. This was just a... Uh, 2019, something like that, compendium. So just less than two years ago. Um, you guys have heard of the silver diamine fluoride, SDF? Is anybody using it? It's okay. I'm, no, no judgments here. Anybody? Okay. So it's about 5.9% fluoride, which is a really high amount. Um, and, and it was created to sensitivity, not for decay. But they noticed that it had that effect, so now I believe the National Institute of Health expended about $10 million to a few universities a couple years ago to conduct trials to decide, can we now make it an anti-karyogenic device? And it was supposed to be um, decided June of last year. I don't think it has been, a, and I could be wrong, sorry, I'm trying to keep up to date on everything, but um, to my knowledge, it still hasn't been officially approved as an anti-karyogenic device, but it's coming. But let me ask you something. What, what could go wrong with uh, adding SDF? You guys know that that's what it does, right? It, 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 it makes the areas that are carious black. So it may indeed stop the decay process, but that's permanent. I mean, what, really? I mean, I could have thought of better ways to, again, with ozone or iodine or the MI paste, you know, and, and then restore those those big lesions with whatever. I mean, you can fill them for an hour, do veneers or whatever. But my point is, is that, that that's not nice looking. That's pretty ugly. So is there an antidote to fluoride overdose, whether it's topical, which is going to be an acute, right, or systemic might be chronic? And there is. And this was in the Journal of Clinical Toxicology, 2004. Every study that I'm going to show you is going to be less than 20 years except for one, which is just to show you a cool reference. But everything I should... And most of them are going to be in the last four to five years. Okay, that's what science is about, right? We learn more. We come out with stuff. We prove it. We don't rely on a study from 1950 that's now been changed. I'm okay on time. Good. Here's a conclusion from this study. Oral administration of a high dose of calcium chloride or magnesium sulfate, simple, safe, and effective adjunctive method for treating severe oral fluoride poisoning. Okay, there's actually a couple other things that you can do, too, that are a little bit uh, probably easier to get. Vitamin C, iodine, selenium. These are actually all really good things for, for trying to fight acute fluoride overdose, okay? Has anybody had that experience with a patient or a child or anything? Anybody? No? Fluoride overdose you have? Yeah, I don't, you know, I mean, I saw, uh, I restored a lot of cases that were uh, moderate to severe fluorosis, which was, yeah, that's life-changing when you take a 16-year-old girl who is being taunted in school and is, and is a beautiful girl except for her teeth, and you restore that, and you change her life, you know. So that's exciting, too, with what we're doing. I mean, whether you're mainstream or not, you can do that, but that's exciting. But when you can change someone's life by giving them information on something that, again, we're, you know, there's still guys that would probably hear this thing and say he's full of crap, but I'm going to show you science that I'm not. I'm going to show you that everything I say today is backed by science. I'm not going to show you this video. I think it's silly. Uh, I don't even think it'll work, so let's just skip it. It's basically, little Julie went to the dentist today. Yay! You know, that kind of stuff. And she's getting whatever, and we don't need to see it. It's, let me just skip it. Okay. Any questions before I get into fluoridation? Because I'm going to, and again, I'm going it'll, to, it'll still touch on some topical stuff too, but um, we're, 
we have an official statement against both use. I, I don't tell dentists they shouldn't use fluoride topically. I never did, except for the first year, as I mentioned. Um, and it's absolutely not necessary. Um, but fluoridation is something that's still heavily going on. And there's some pretty big battles happening right now, like in Calgary, Canada, and Spokane, Washington, and some other places, you know. And I give credit to, I would never say this because I will never go to Portland, no offense, after seeing what happened this past year. But to Portland's credit, they stopped fluoridation. Uh, and um, they're a big city, you know. I'm from Austin, and we tried, you know, we fought and went to the city council and showed them everything. So I argued with the medical director. We did news stories and everything. And bottom line, uh, you asked earlier about someone did about ADA, what's making them stop doing this or whatever. Well, I can tell you for a fact, because I know this, I did a lot of research into it, is that you do have to follow the dollar, and it's sad. But in the case of Austin, when we were fighting this, this was about 2011, things were coming out. It was a pretty good year. Uh, for us who were fighting fluoride. And um, I found out, I, I was like, why is the city council, and, like they meet with me privately, they tell me something in my face, and then they just poo-poo it and vote against it. And I thought, why, what's going on? Well, in 2011, they had received $9 million from the CDC, the biggest proponents, even bigger than ADA on water fluoridation, $9 million to do a smoking cessation study. Nobody smokes in Austin. It's a smoke-free city now for 20-plus years. I mean, people smoke, but you get my point. Why would we need $9 million to do some surveys on smoking cessation? doesn't matter. You don't bite the hand that feeds you, right? And little small towns, they're easy to convince because it's expensive to fluoridate, right? It's anywhere from $800,000 to $1 million a year to add this chemical. It's not even sodium fluoride, as I mentioned. Um, but a small town, that's a big deal, and so you can get small towns to stop pretty easily. But big cities, it's tough. So that's why I applaud places like Portland who did it, and hopefully Calgary won't. Questions about topical or alternatives before we move on? Yes, Mike. On the topic of topical, I mean, if somebody's having a heart attack, you put nitroglycerin underneath their tongue because it's absorbed so well. So the only disagreement I have with you is that if you put a topical, you're never going to prevent it from going systemic. I don't. If, if I'm wrong, please correct No, you're not wrong. I, I'm, I'm trying to keep, you know. Yeah, I love your presentation, by the way. The okay. uh, pineal gland is extremely important because that's your rhythm. And as people get older, you can't detoxify it. And in so many autopsies of older people who couldn't sleep, who couldn't function, the pineal gland was calcified and non-functional. So yeah. uh, I, I just wanted to bring that up for people because... It has to be emphasized more. Yeah, I, I know. Of life is, is terrible for I, I, Honestly, I don't want to ever be accused of, oh, he was so biased. <laughs> All he did was talk about, I, and that's why I'm, I'm showing you everything, guys, but I, I am strongly against fluoride in all forms. One other uh, topic. When you said to put an IRM in, I don't know if he used biodentine. Just another example. Yeah, it, I find that as a better product. Yeah. It's a little more difficult to handle. Sure. But with experience, you can, and uh, it prevents the further development of caries very well. Thank yeah. You. Oh, sure. Thanks, Mike. And, you know, I said this, but I want to say it again because it's going to sound very counter to what we're taught. You can leave a little bit of decay right on top of that pulp, but you got to ozonate it. Right? You can't just say, well, if I go any further, I'm going to expose the pulp, so I'll just stop. you got to do something proactive. And tell the patients, right? I tell them. I mean, you know how you see your x-ray before, and you're like, oh, my God, this is so deep. And, and they'll say, what do I do? I go, well, I'll ask them the, our normal questions. Is it hot, sensitive? Is it throb at night? You know, is it already into the – if you can do a 3D scan, that's all the better. My point is that if you can show that it's not yet abscessed, you got a fighting chance. Don't give up on it and say, go to the endodontist or pull it. You know, those are the two options, right? I have a question. Um, we use ozone very heavily in our office. Yeah. Absolutely love it and have amazing <clears throat> results. Patients are thrilled with it. Yeah. We <clears throat> are not using it with the trays. The trays. I've never seen that. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? How often do you use it? How many Great. treatments on average? Great question. What do you charge? Great question. Okay. So, yeah, let's, because I did just kind of glaze over that. So the trays that I mentioned are going to cost you about $200 for the upper and lower total. Uh, North Star laboratory is the place that knows us they make them they have the ports and everything i don't know where they are i think they're up in the east coast somewhere but north star takes about 10 days to get it so you might charge your patient i charge my patient i say look it's a one-time cost of 450 dollars 
to get the trays. Again, your cost is about 200 so it's not crazy, right? So if it's for periodontal disease, like they've got bad gum disease, and you're trying everything, you're doing ozone water, you're deep cleanings, whatever you do, then I would do that four to five times a year. And I'll tell them that. And I'll say, you'll come in, and not, not the same time as the cleaning, by the way, just for that visit. You're going to come in, I'm going to put you in room five. We're going to do it for 15 to 20 minutes in the top arch, to take it off, put it on the lower, same amount, okay? I charge, I'm reasonable, I charge 195 for that. You can charge probably 250 or higher, and they wouldn't balk. But to me, see, ozone is like, it's such a little cost for us once you have the equipment that I just feel like I can make some things really reasonable. Like if I do a nasal push on someone, uh, Phil will probably talk about it later, I charge 10 bucks. It's three cc's of ozone, their nose for a sinus infection or whatever, it's 10 bucks. It takes you 10, five seconds. But if they're going to breathe nasal insufflation where they're laying back and you've got a cannula and it's running through oil, and it, for, for 20 minutes or so, I'll charge 200 bucks. Or, yeah. So, I mean, you know, you can, I mean, the neat, you know, what I don't talk about in this presentation because you don't care because uh, it's about fluoride, but, you know, ozone, um, listen, we're a business too, right? We, we, we need to be profitable. Otherwise, you know, there's nothing wrong about talking about money. I'm not into gouging, but there's nothing wrong with making money on what you do. Ozone for me is a forty to fifty thousand dollar additional income a year, right? Meaning into the office, not not in my pocket. But my point is, is that ninety percent of the ozone things I'm not even involved with. I mean, I check the numbers and the get, you know, make sure everything's good. But your assistants can put the trays in. They can run it. They can do ear. They can do nasal. They can do all the stuff around the, the gum line. Your hygienist can, you know, they can do so much. Your auxiliaries, right? Now, if I'm injecting, obviously, ozone in the body, and that's a whole different topic, we won't talk about that today, that's different. I'm doing that, right? But still, the bottom line is don't, don't feel bad about making money on a really great service, right? And you know that, right? I mean, ozone, oh, to me, it's the game changer. I mean, I, I just think when in doubt, go to ozone. I mean, for whatever. It's crazy. Okay, I said this earlier, 95 to 97% of the world does not fluoridate. Why do we think we're so smart? I mean, and then even people that did have either abandoned it now with the newest science, you know? And I'm going to show you some really cool science. Or tell me. Well, hang on. Uh, on time, we have five minutes till lunch, right? Okay. So you know what? We'll, we'll save this. Perfect timing for the next hour. But go ahead. Which system do you recommend for the ozone, and how do you take care of the odor? Oh, there's only one, and it's longevity. Uh, they're the only ones, uh, to my, in my, hang on, in my opinion, that, that uh, make the machine right with glass parts, tubes, silicone connections, things that are not going to be degraded by ozone. And, you know, I mean, Roger Chown, who runs that company, you can call him up. He'll, he'll talk to you on the phone. He'll back up everything. It's an amazing machine. I, the smell, honestly, I rarely smell it if you do it right. So, so you'll learn uh, if you ever take the course, you know, there's a, you got to have like, you know, if you're running it through water, then, then it's staying in that flask, which is sealed. If not, you've got a discharge thing at the end, like a, it's, a, it's a destructor where if you're, if you're just, if you've got the machine running, you have your tube ending into a destructor where it's just, it, it keeps it sealed. So you're not smelling it. The only time you'll smell it is if you maybe flip the switch to put like a tube and get some air and, and maybe you weren't fast enough or your little plunger on your, on your syringe comes out, you might, you know, but really, if you're careful with it, you shouldn't smell it that much unless you're right next to it, okay? And by the way, it's not a bad smell. I mean, I hated it at first. I did. I hated it. But to me, it, it means clean now. Like, I feel clean when I smell it. Now, on one, one, uh, one additional note on that, you can't breathe it right in your nose, right? You'll start coughing aggressively. So it is harmful to the lungs if you don't handle it right. So if you get too much like that, and, and I'll confess, uh, the, the one big mistake I made um, was I was treating a little child that had, uh, had trigger thumbs, Bill knows this, three-year-old, and I said, look, I can't treat a th there's no way, I don't, first of all, I don't treat kids anymore, but I'm not going to inject ozone in a three-year-old's thumbs, it'll never happen, you've got to do something, I heard it'll help, I said, you know what, let me limb bag it, so you can take a bag, right, uh, I'd go around, you can seal it around the hand, right, and have a little port for your ozone to go in, and you can innervate that hand for whatever, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, whatever. Phil will get into this in more detail later. And stupid me, at this first one I did on this kid, I said, well, okay, we're all done. Let's take the bag off. 
without suctioning, and I mean, the kid starts just, and, but, but what did I do? I, I at least learned this. I gave the kid vitamin C, uh, just an emergency in the bottle. Kid sipped it, and, and in one second, stopped coughing. But it can be violent, so you've got to give vitamin C as the quick antidote. Okay, let's not talk too much about ozone unless there's another. I have a question, I have a question about iodine. Um, yeah. Provodone versus um, Lugol's and the protocol for anti-cavity treatment. Well, as I mentioned, you don't have to do it that often, right? I mean, even if you only did it every time the patient came in for a hygiene visit, you're doing a world of good. But, you know, six times a year, the povidone. So, so in, in, in our office, because it does stain, right? So I, I dilute it a little bit, and you can have them gargle for 60 seconds and spit it out. You can even take... Uh, have your hygienist put some in a little, uh, like an ultrasonic system if you want, and do a little bit of that just during the treatment itself. It's not something you want to do by any means daily or even weekly, right? It's pretty powerful. But six times a year, you know, povidone's fine. I thought we stopped doing Lugol's, didn't we? Yeah, so I stick with povidone or that nascent, as I mentioned, that active eye. One more question, and then, and then we have lunch, okay? Hey, wait, well, where is lunch? But is it, do they go upstairs or? Upstairs and outside, lunch, 12 to 1, we'll be back here at 1. Go ahead. So I haven't actually done the ozone trays myself, but patients say that they, like, tend to hurt and not feel good and, like, all this stuff. Are you experiencing yeah. the same thing? Yeah, I'll tell you how you avoid that because okay. it, it happened to me the first time, too. So as I mentioned, I said there's a port coming in from the ozone machine and one going to your suction. What I do is I put it in my high volume, but I only open the high volume a tiny bit, right, to where it's just, because it will, if you put it in the high volume directly, it's going to suck down, it's going to hurt. So you do it just enough to where they go, okay, I feel that, and that's it. So you can, you can regulate that, right? Some put it in their slow suction, but I don't feel like that's strong enough to do it. So I do it high, but I barely open my thing. And you can kind of lay it. You take your little white, and you, put, you can lay it right in the, and maybe hold it with some cotton or something to where it's not going to fly out, you know. But you gotta, you'll learn that because you, you'll make that mistake one time. No, not full-blown at all because you want that ozone to stay there for a while, right? Don't worry. This is not an ozone discussion. I just mentioned it in passing, and they're running with it. Fluoride questions before we run out of here? <laughs> okay, so let's go to lunch, guys. And remember, be back here at 1, okay, promptly, please.